Good day, everyone. My name is Jennifer Slansky Jester, and I am the director of the Collective Impact Forum, a partnership between FSG and the Aspen Institute Forum for Community Solutions. On behalf of the forum and FSG, I am delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, Evaluating Collective Impact, Assessing Your Progress, Effectiveness, and Impact. We have a terrific program lined up for you today with a tremendous group of speakers that you will see outlined here on the slide on your screen. But before we get started, I did want to touch on a few items. As a friendly reminder, given the depth of the content today, our webinar will be 90 minutes, not 60 minutes, as our typical webinars are. We have also reserved time at the end for Q&A. And you may submit questions throughout the webinar in the box, Ask a Question, in the lower left portion of your player. You can use this both for questions for our speakers as well as technical questions. There's also a technical FAQ tab at the top right in case that is needed during the webinar uh, due to your technological capabilities. Today's slides will be available following the presentation at collectiveimpactforum.org as well. And one last note, during today's presentation, your slides will automatically be synchronized with the audio, so you don't need to do any flipping of the slides to follow along. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Hallie Preskill, Managing Director at FSG, who will give us an overview of the Guide to Evaluating Collective Impact. Hallie? Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you're all online today. Um, we're really excited to sponsor this webinar. Uh, we have some great panelists, as Jen said. But I wanted just to give you kind of a context for what um, you're going to be hearing and, and participating in today. Over the last three years, um, scores of funders and hundreds of communities and thousands of individuals have been learning about and starting to design and implement collective impact initiatives. Not surprisingly, much of their time over the last three years has spent, been spent um, really focusing their energy around understanding what collective impact is and the and this early stages of getting started. However, as more and more CI initiatives got underway, we began to notice that an increasing number of questions started shifting from what is collective impact and how do we do it to how do we evaluate our collective impact initiatives, progress, and impact. So as a result, FSD embarked on developing a guide to evaluating collective impact, which was published a few weeks ago. This three-part guide, which is free to download on both the Collective Impact Forum and FSU websites, is designed for collective impact practitioners, funders, evaluators, and other supporters to help them think about, plan for, and implement evaluation and performance measurement activities. So today's webinar covers some of the content in this guide and provides a backdrop to our panelists' presentations. To provide you with a brief overview of the Collective Impact Evaluation Framework and some of the details, I'm going to hand it over to Marcy Parkhurst, a co-author on the guide and a senior consultant with FSG. Marcy? Thanks, Hallie, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone on the line. We're so excited to have you with us today. Our audience this morning includes funders, evaluators, and practitioners with a range of levels of experience working in collective impact and evaluation. To ensure that we all enter today's webinar from the same starting point, I'd like to just take a moment to talk about what I mean when I say collective impact, and specifically, how this approach differs from other types of collaborative change efforts. Collective impact is defined as the commitment of a group of important actors from different sectors to a common agenda for solving a specific problem. Collective impact efforts are not right for every problem that they are a very effective way of addressing complex social and environmental issues such as poor health outcomes or childhood poverty. As illustrated on this slide, collective impact efforts are distinguished by their adoption of five core conditions, including, first, a common agenda, which reflects all participants' shared vision for change, including their common understanding of the problem and their joint approach to solving it through agreed upon action. Second, a shared measurement system, which enables all participants in a CI initiative to collect data and measure results consistently across organizations and programs to ensure that efforts remain aligned and that participants hold each other accountable. Third, mutually reinforcing activities. This means that all participants' activities must be differentiated while still being coordinated through a mutually reinforcing plan of action. Fourth, there must be continuous communication 
by which I mean consistent and open communication, to allow an initiative's many diverse participants to build trust, assure mutual objectives, and create common motivation. Finally, the initiative must be supported by a strong backbone function. Creating and managing a collective impact initiative requires dedicated staff with specific skills to coordinate participating organizations. Now that we're on the same page about what collective impact is, let's move to the next slide to consider the need for a specific approach to evaluating collective impact. Our research indicates that typical program evaluation models are not always sufficiently robust to accurately assess the progress and impact of a complex collective impact initiative. Successfully evaluating these initiatives requires a mindset shift for many funders and practitioners. For example, Whereas typical approaches to program evaluation aim to assess the impact of a specific intervention and evaluate effects and impact according to a predetermined set of outcomes, a CI evaluation must assess multiple parts of a system and must evaluate intended and unintended outcomes as they emerge over time. This also means that a CI evaluation must evaluate nonlinear and non-directional relationships between an initiative and its outcomes. Finally, of course, a CI evaluation must embed feedback and learning throughout the evaluation, not only at the end, in order to provide timely information that supports ongoing strategic refinement. A final difference between CI evaluation and more typical approaches to program evaluation is the relationship between CI evaluation and shared measurement. Let's turn to that on the next slide. We define evaluation as, next, a range of activities that involve the plans, purposeful, and systematic collection of information about the activities, characteristics, and outcomes of a CI initiative. As the next part of the graphic shows, this definition is inclusive of shared measurement, which refers to the use of a common set of indicators to monitor an initiative's performance and track its progress toward goals. Shared measurement systems provide invaluable data to partners and funders who seek to understand the question of what progress is being made. But they can't help funders or practitioners understand how or why an initiative is or isn't making progress. For that, they need evaluation. As we discuss in detail in the paper, these two approaches are complementary. Data from a shared measurement system, for example, can serve as an input to a broader evaluation. Data from the shared measurement system can also help shape the focus of an evaluation. For example, an initiative's leaders may want to know why they've been making progress on a certain indicator for several months and then seem to suddenly lose ground. Now that we've talked a bit about how CI evaluation is different and how it relates to shared measurement, let's move into a discussion of the nuts and bolts of how to do CI evaluation on the next slide. We found that when people think about collective impact, they often think about the five core conditions of the CI process, as I reviewed earlier, and their ultimate desired outcomes. What's less clear, though, is how the initiative gets from point A to point B, how partners in an initiative can track their progress along the journey, and how they can understand their effectiveness along the way. That's why we recommend that partners in a CI initiative evaluate their progress and impact at four levels. First, let's talk about context. We define an initiative's context as a range of factors, such as local economic conditions, demographics, and a community's history, that influence the ways in which and the extent to which the initiative is successful. As we all know, context changes all the time, so it's very important that participants in an initiative maintain their awareness of changes in local conditions and circumstances throughout the initiative's lifetime. Next, CI partners should evaluate the initiative itself, including the effectiveness of the five core conditions, as well as the initiative's learning culture and overall capacity, including financial resources, staff, and skills and, ex ex skills and expertise. I'd like to pause here to emphasize the importance of evaluating the CI initiative itself. As many of you who are engaged in this work know, the real power of the collective impact approach lies in the process. The ability to unite diverse groups around a common purpose, encourage open discussion and ongoing communication, support coordination and alignment of activities, and promote learning and continuous improvement. Without a healthy collective impact initiative, 
there is unlikely to be any collective impact. Next. The third aspect of an initiative that's important to evaluate is what's happening with the systems and behaviors that influence the target problem. These may include things like funding flows, public policies, cultural norms, and patterns of individual behavior. Understanding the extent to which and the ways in which the, these changes are occurring is critical to understanding a CI initiative's overall progress and impact. For example, Shape Up Somerville, a CI initiative focused on lowering rates of childhood obesity in one Massachusetts city, attributes its success in part to a constellation of systems level changes, including increased funding for anti-obesity work, healthier menu offerings in public schools and local restaurants, new bicycle lanes, and improvements in physical education equipment in schools and after-school programs throughout the city. Without these systems-level changes, Shape Up Somerville may not have been as successful as it was in lowering local rates of childhood obesity. Next. Finally, of course, collective impact partners should keep a watchful eye on progress toward their ultimate goals. We know that most of you are pretty good at this part, so I'll just leave it at that for now. On the next slide, I'll talk about how all of these aspects of the CI change process come together over time and what the implications are for evaluation. The CI theory of change illustrates at a conceptual level how an initiative evolves over time. The point here isn't to be prescriptive about what happens when or how quickly an initiative evolves. That's all context specific. The point is to help CI partners identify important inflection points in an initiative's maturity and identify potential areas of focus for performance measurement and evaluation. This graphic is organized to show a sequence of activities and outcomes over time. And despite the linear arrangement of the elements on this page, we know that the CI change process is not linear and that progress is not predictable. That's in part why we've included context as the backdrop for this theory of change. It's represented by the gray box behind all of the other elements, and why we've illustrated the importance of continuous learning using orange arrows. Let's walk through this stage by stage. On the left side, in initiative's early years, which could be 12 to 18 months or could be two to three years, partners are coming together to decide what their initiative will look like, what its goals will be, and how they'll seek to achieve those goals. Anticipated outcomes at this stage of an initiative are largely related to context and process. In the initiative's middle years, partners are firming up their initiative's infrastructure and starting to shift patterns of behavior and influence the way systems operate. It's likely that many CI initiatives will start to see evidence of progress toward ultimate outcomes at this stage as well. Finally, and in the initiative's later years, CI partners will look for evidence of sustainable impact on their targeted issue. On the next slide, we overlay several approaches to performance measurement and evaluation on top of this theory of change. This graphic illustrates the relationship between performance measurement and evaluation and how different combinations of these approaches can be used over time. The orange arrows along the bottom of the page indicate the use of performance measurement approaches, which we define as the ongoing monitoring and reporting of accomplishments and progress toward outcomes. Performance measurement approaches tell CI partners what is happening in their initiative. Below this line, the evaluation arrows in turquoise represent different approaches to evaluation which can help partners understand why things are happening the way they are. In an initiative's early years, we recommend that CI partners use a combination of early performance indicators and developmental evaluation to support their learning needs. Early performance indicators can help partners track their progress in establishing key elements of the initiative's infrastructure. Developmental evaluation can provide early feedback and insights into how well the initiative is designed, how it's being implemented, and how well it adapts to changes in context. We'll hear more about how developmental evaluation is helping support the design and implementation of an emerging collective impact initiative in just a few minutes. In an initiative's middle years, we recommend a combination of formative evaluation, perhaps with elements of de developmental evaluation, in addition to data from in the initiative shared measurement system. Formative evaluation can help partners refine, improve, and fine tune their work. It can answer questions like, how well are pieces of our strategy working and why? And where are we experiencing challenges and why? 
We'll hear more from the Roadmap Project soon about how formative evaluation is supporting their progress in the initiative's middle years. Finally, in initiative's later years, it may be appropriate to commission or conduct a summative evaluation to assess the initiative's impact, value, or significance. Data from the shared measurement system can, of course, contribute to this summative evaluation. Determining the specific combination of performance measurement and evaluation approaches that is most appropriate at a given point in time depends on partners' information needs. Let's take a look at some examples of the learning questions that partners may seek to answer on the next slide. We encourage collective impact partners to carefully consider the specific learning questions they seek to answer before determining the most appropriate approach to evaluation. We've included many examples of learning questions in the guide to evaluating collective impact. So I'll just touch briefly here on question two, a learning question about CI design and implementation that's focused on the effectiveness of the initiative's backbone. This question asks, to what extent and in what ways is the backbone infrastructure providing the leadership, support, and guidance partners need to do their work as planned? Let's turn to the next slide to see an example of how partners in a CI initiative might seek to answer that question. On this slide, we see that CI partners can look for evidence of one or more outcomes of backbone effectiveness in the form of multiple indicators. For example, the first outcome on this page shows how CI partners would know that their backbone was providing effective leadership if they found evidence that the backbone was effectively guiding the initiative's vision and strategy. To determine this, partners could look at indicators that assess the extent to which, for example, the backbone infrastructure builds and maintains hope and motivation to achieve the initiative's goals, or the extent to which it celebrates and disseminates achievements of CI partners internally and externally. Part three of the Guide to Evaluating Collective Impact contains a large set of sample learning questions, outcomes, and indicators for CI initiatives at different stages of development. We would love to hear your feedback on these sample outcomes and indicators, and we welcome you to contribute your own outcomes and indicators on the CI forum, which Jen will talk about a bit later. Before I hand this off to Mary Jean and Christopher to walk you through the roadmap project example, I just want to wrap up with three key takeaways on the next slide. First, we encourage partners in a CI initiative to embed evaluation throughout the initiative. This means, first, that CI partners must embrace the practices of continuous learning and adaptation. It also means that the chosen approach to evaluation must match the initiative stage of development. And it means that sufficient financial and logistical support for evaluation and learning is crucial to the initiative's success. The second key takeaway is that it's important to set the right expectations for evaluation. This means managing expectations about results and accountability, committing to measuring progress as well as evaluating effectiveness and impact, and being patient about progress toward outcomes. Finally, we encourage funders and practitioners to be thoughtful about choosing evaluation partners. It's important to look for partners who understand complexity and are willing to flex and adapt with you as you move along your learning journey. I hope that's been a helpful overview. And now to, to give us more specific information about how to evaluate a real-life collective impact initiative, I'll hand this over to Mary Jean Ryan, the Executive Director of the Community Center for Education Results, also known as CCER, the Roadmap Project's backbone, and to Christopher Mazio from Education Northwest, who's been leading the formative evaluation work with CCER. Great. Uh Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Mary Jean Ryan, and it's a real honor to be participating in this webinar. Uh, I thought what I would do is just start and uh, just speak very briefly about the roadmap project so um, everyone knows a little bit about it, and then we'll move rapidly into how evaluation is helping us improve. So first of all, uh, the roadmap project is a collective impact initiative, and our aim is to get dramatic improvement in student achievement, and we say cradle through college and career. And our geography is South Seattle and South King County. Those are the suburbs south of Seattle, and they are our region's areas of highest need. Next, please. 
we started our project in 2010, and uh, our first big activity was building what we call our indicators of student success. Essentially, we, we built our shared measurement system. Uh, we set our project's big goal, we set targets for 2020, and also interim targets. And then we built our capability to report our results uh, uh, against those targets and indicators. But our project is not um, simply a reporting, uh, community reporting project. It's a let's make things happen project. So we did a set of action plans with hundreds of people participating. We did a birth to third grade action plan, parent engagement, high school to college completion, and so on. And so, um, uh, you know, really for us, um, evaluation uh, is a great tool because it is going to help us understand how uh, we're making progress and um, the feedback is incredibly important. Next slide, please. Just a little more on the project. Uh, when we, these are, these, as you know, are such complicated uh, endeavors. Um, and so when we look at our project, we try to boil it down and um, think about what we're really trying to do. And we see four big things that we're working on. One is alignment. So every implementer, anybody that we think can influence one of our indicators and drive improvement, um, we're trying to get involved in, and push um, and strengthen alignment. Uh, for our project, we believe parent and community engagement is a critical ingredient. Um, obviously, the power of data, uh, and it runs all through our project to fuel continuous improvement work. And just a big focus on building stronger systems uh, all the way from cradle to um, through college and career. So about two years into the project, our major funder came to us and asked us if we thought it would be beneficial to have some evaluation help along the way, and we were really thrilled to have that opportunity. Um, I like to say there's no roadmap for the roadmap, and uh, these projects are very challenging. And so, as has been stated, you can have your objective system level um, measurements, but it's hard to know if you're making headway along the way, because some of the things you're trying to change take time. So those interim milestones are very important. So we were really, really happy to have this opportunity to work with Ed Northwest. They're based out of Portland, um, and to have help uh, with a formative assessment. So Chris Mazio now is going to talk a little bit about the approach that um, they've taken in their work with us. Thanks, Mary Jane. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Christopher Mazio. I'm with Education Support West. And as Mary Jane said, we are Portland-based nonprofit applied research and development organization. We were thrilled to begin working with uh, CCER and Mary Dean and her team. Um, it, this work of collective impact is very aligned with our mission strength. And the approach we took in Sorry to interrupt, Chris. We, we can barely hear you. Uh, could you pick up your handset or speak directly into the phone? My, yes, my handset is, is picked up. I, I will keep talking, trying to be a little more clear. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so the, the project began, uh, the evaluation of the project began around two years ago, as Mary Jean suggested. Sorry, folks, we're having a little technical issue with the mic sound. Um, and uh, we began our work um, focused around helping roadmap Can, can folks, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, we can hear you now, Chris. Thanks so much. Okay, sorry about that. So we, we began working about two years ago to really help, as, as Mary Jean said, understand better uh, how the roadmap project was working and what, what was going on in the region. Uh, Marcy mentioned earlier there were kind of two key dimensions of, uh, of kind of learning questions, and we really focused on numbers two and three focused on collective impact design and looking at initial outcomes and systems change. So as you can see from the slide, we had kind of three broad areas of questions that we brought to the evaluation initially. Uh, the first was really about implementation. Given the complexity of a collective impact initiative, 
how is it being implemented on the ground? Uh, what are the roles of all the partners and the organizations in the region? Um, how are the work groups, which one of the core parts of the initiative, really doing their planning and their action work? And how much progress are they making? And particularly, how is the backbone, in this case TCDR, supporting that work and really helping to move uh, the outcomes that Roadmap is trying to move? We also re delved really deeply into, in that second question, Roadmap's own theory of change or theory of action. Roadmap has a very specific uh, logic model and theory of change, and we really wanted to make sure the evaluation helped provide information about that. So that those four uh, pillars that were in the previous slide, alignment, engagement, data, and then systems change, were all key components of the evaluation and were all things we focused tremendous energy on understanding through our, our data collection. And then lastly, and this is the piece of the evaluation I think that we're moving more towards now in the last year and a half or so of the evaluation, particularly getting at how do all those kind of core pieces, uh, the basic elements of the roadmap project, lead to systems change within and across organizations in the region. If you could turn to the next slide. So we approached this work like a lot of formative evaluation through multiple methods. Uh, we did surveys of both stakeholders and core members of roadmap work groups and other uh, initiative at, uh, key people. We did interviews with a smaller subset of folks. We attended meetings, observed, uh, just got a feel for the project, and we um, did some targeted uh, data collection through documents and other kinds of things. And we have organized the findings in this slide according to those four key dimensions of the roadmap theory of change that Mary Jean laid out. So our first key finding was, is really around alignment. And we were very happy to see that, that there was pretty strong evidence of alignment of policies, practices, funding decisions, and other aspects of the roadmap project. So we found tremendous alignment of all the actors in the work, which is an important part of any initiative, that people are working uh, sort of together and not at cross purposes. We also found uh, on that second bullet very, very high engagement um, with the initiative by stakeholders in the region. Uh, we did a survey and found nearly unanimous, over 90% commitment to the core goal of doubling the numbers of credentialed students. And we found really high buy-in to the approach and the work of Roadmap, where we found a need for improvement and a need to kind of evolve was the, the challenge that all big initiatives have in, in, in communities to really work to engage all stakeholders meaningfully. And that was an important piece of feedback that we provided fairly early on to the initiative. Uh, the third set of findings is really around the theory of change aspect of data. Uh, again, we found tremendous uh, progress on building data capacity and adopting both the shared measurement system and even other metrics that organizations across the region could use to track progress. Uh, on the data side, we did also find people were occasionally, I would say, a little overwhelmed sometimes to think about how do we make sense of all this data we have and how do we use it towards a system-wide and region-wide improvement strategy. And then last, we saw some evidence of uh, increase in collaboration within and across sectors and some very promising initial examples of systems change. This part of the evaluation is going to really, as I mentioned before, be our focus going forward. But we, we did see some promise of organizations working differently within, within and across the, the region. And we feel like that is something that's going to be an important part of where we go forward. If you could turn the slide, I think Mary Jean is now going to talk about sort of her reflections on what they learned from working with us over the last couple of years. Thank you, Chris. Um, one thing I, I also just want to bring out is that um, just as these projects progress in phases, the way that we have approached the evaluation is also um, contemplated to uh, 
go in phases. And, and so what, what we're talking about uh, today is the approach that we took on the first phase uh, of the formative evaluation. And we're right now working together to create how we want to do things for the second phase. Um, and it will be uh, quite different. Uh, the first phase results were uh, really helpful to us. Uh, first, I would say they were heartening, which um, in this work is uh, important because it's so difficult. And if you felt that after four years of work that you were not on the right track, um, that might be a little disturbing. But the uh, broad support for the goal was so uh, so widespread and 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 deep um, across our sector. So that was really exciting. But people want more. That's what I took. If there was one thing, they want more uh, ways to connect into the project. They want more information about how the project works. They want more actionable data. Um, so all of those things are things we can respond to. And, uh, and have. So we've developed some new communication tools. We've um, changed many of our structures to allow more people to be involved. Uh, we're uh, doing a lot more to bring data to our community and to our school districts. Another thing that came out, and, and it was a really important finding, is that many stakeholders asked us to heighten the focus on racial equity. And that's always been at the core uh, principles of our project. Uh, and but it was interesting to us to to have people say we needed to do a better job uh, to have that focus uh, come through more. So we have done a lot of changing of our communications. We've had an award program that was really successful uh, that focused on racial equity and excellence in efforts that are trying to close achievement gaps. Um, we're starting to do community uh, data roundtables um, by race and ethnicity with lots of partners. So um, I guess the main message is people wanted um, more things from us uh, that we were on the right track uh, and more things that are actionable. Um, we have a real large geography uh, covering seven school districts and many communities. Uh, and so we have to put a lot more attention now in the next phase to looking at efforts that are working and getting them to scale and thinking about sustainability. So those will be some of the themes um, that we'll be looking at in the next phase of evaluation. So now I'm going to hand it back to Chris. If you could advance, oh, great, thank you. So uh, just to wrap up, we wanted to kind of provide some reflections on our experience with Roadmap for folks who are either hiring evaluators or evaluating collective impact initiatives. Uh, and the first slide really, the first bullet point there, really points to collective impact is very, very complex. And to, to evaluate it well requires very, very close partnership with uh, the funder of the evaluation and, of course, the backbone organization. So that requires a lot of iterations of questions and approaches and reports and really a willingness to kind of be, be told by, in lots of cases, Mary Jean, that's not quite what we want or that's not quite what we need or you're not quite getting it. And that is, I think, a crucial part of an evaluation on this kind of work, working in close partnership and the willingness to adapt to both the needs of the, of the backbone and also just changing conditions. That's something that I think we've learned in this stage uh, of the work is really, really important. Um, we've written and rewritten many, uh, many of our materials just to be able to really help um, crystallize the work for CCER and for the funder in ways that were helpful to them. So second, I, you know, I really want to emphasize that the line in formative evaluation of collective impact between kind of doing evaluation and supporting the backbone and helping to build their capacity is, is really a, a, a fairly small one, a fairly thin one. Uh, Mary Jean and her team are an incredibly high capacity team and a really, really sophisticated organization. But collective impact in a region as, as big as Seattle is, is, as Mary Jean suggested, very complicated and very complex. And part of, I think, what an evaluator can do in our team, uh, the four of us have been able to do, is really help uh, 
roadmap wrap their mind around what is the project, what are the key pieces, how does evaluation, how does our work inform that, and how can we continually build the organization's ability to understand and use data to inform that. Um, for example, early on in the project, we worked very closely with Mary Jean and her team to just really take the large theory of change that the, the initiative had and distill it down to some of the core work groups to understand what were their theories of change, what were their logic models, and how was that work trying to ultimately drive towards the, the key goals and key indicators. So that's a really important part of being an evaluation partner for a collective impact initiative, particularly at this sort of middle stage. Third, um, and this touches a little bit on something Marcy mentioned, we, we really think it's, it's crucially important that shared measurement systems be complemented with more fine-grained data collection efforts. Um, this is not only involving just doing an evaluation per se like we're doing, but really getting into the nuts and bolts of how and why something is happening in a region. So to give you an example, uh, one of the core components of the shared measurement system for roadmap it are two indicators around triggering early warning system, uh, early warning um, indicators for students in ninth grade. Uh, those indicators, like a lot of shared measurement indicator systems, are generally tracked annually. Uh, but what is crucial for a collective impact initiative is to understand how the work it's doing, in this case, in the seven districts, in the schools throughout the region, is helping to move those particular indicators and reduce the numbers of students who are, are failing classes or being, being disciplined or being suspended. So what evaluation and what other forms of data collection can do is really inform that. So you can get a feel for the texture of how and why and what is happening uh, and even get more granular to understand why might something be moving in one of the districts or five of the districts but not in others. So these efforts really need to complement each other to really provide actionable information, as Mary Jean suggested, for the initiative. And then last, and this goes without saying for all evaluations, but in collective impact, it's particularly to understand who is the evaluation for and what are their information needs. Uh, we spent a lot of time working to understand what CCER needs, and, and it's also equally important to understand what the funder needs from an evaluation. What about the larger community? Collective impact is, of course, always led by a backbone and core partners, but Seattle and, and the King County region is a big community. What else do people need in that region to really understand the initiative and, and the progress that's being made? And finally, what are other organizations and other in initiatives outside of the region and outside of, of, uh, of roadmap need to understand about what we've done and what we, we have been learning through this? So, it's really important to be mindful of audience. So with that, I'm going to turn it now to Hallie, and she's going to, I think, lead us in a little bit of a Q&A. Great. Thank you so much, Mary Jean and Chris. Um, just so you all know, we have nearly 500 people on this webinar, and the questions you've been providing are fantastic. And unfortunately, we won't have time to answer them all, but we're, we were looking through many of them. And um, to let you know that we have about nine minutes or so for our Q&A for Mary Jean and Chris. And then we'll go to our second set of panelists, Kathleen and Julia. They'll give their presentation. Then we'll have about nine minutes for Q&A for them specifically. And then we'll have time um, left over at the end for a general Q&A for any of our panelists. Mary Jean and, um, will need to leave in about um, 20 minutes or so, so, this, so, so she will only be able to participate in this part of the Q&A, just for your information. So um, Mary Jean and Chris, um, there are such a wide variety of questions, and one question um, uh, that a lot of folks are asking about has to do with um, the kind of questions you ask to gather data, but how did you present the findings to different partners and were partners involved in analyzing the data? So there's a lot of questions around the partner's involvement in the evaluation process as well as um, the receipt and in involvement in getting the findings. Can either of you say something about that perhaps? Uh, well, we, we um, we presented the findings and had discussions of the findings in a whole host of forums. We have a lot of work groups and uh, coordination mechanism groups and steering groups, and so um, the relevant 
uh, portions of the information uh, were presented and discussed. And then, you know, on our website, obviously, we have a big quarterly convening where highlights were presented of the surveys. They um, at Northwest surveyed uh, very broadly and interviewed also um, very broadly. Um, so the the findings also were provided back to the people who were surveyed and um, interviewed. And then just, just to add on to that, um, one of the things that we did, as, as, as Mary Jean suggested, we, we presented this work to lots of different groups that are part of Roadmap Work Groups and others. And where possible, we tried to slice and dice the data so people could sort of see what it meant for their particular piece of Roadmap. So if we were able, for example, to have a big enough sample to share something for a particular work group, we would do that. If we were providing information that was particularly relevant for the sponsors group that would be actionable for them, we might foreground that. So uh, I do recommend that folks who are thinking about this really be, be thoughtful about multiple multiple formats and multiple even sort of ways of framing the same basic findings for the different audiences because that was a really crucial part to be able to get this out beyond just the backbone and the thunder. Great. Thank you both. Um, another question has to do, um, uh, Chris, um, uh, around the role that you've played in this evaluation, your team. Um, and the question uh, specifically was, uh, would you say that you and your team function more as an internal evaluator or evaluators with the roadmap, or did you remain external? And would you recommend that large CI initiatives consider budgeting for internal rather than external evaluators? Um, and then there's other questions around the role, of whether you provide a technical assistance um, and so on. So can you talk a little bit about the role? And, and Mary Jane, if you want to respond about how that role worked for you as, as well. Sure. Um, this is actually a nice time to acknowledge the, the team. There are four of us who are working on the project now, five total. So I want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Terry Aki, and Ashley Nagel, and Julie Petrakubi, and Elizabeth Audio, who have all worked on this evaluation. And, this is a complex evaluation that requires a big team. Um, in terms of the way we work, I mean, we are an external organization. We're not based in Seattle. We're an in independent nonprofit. So we, we are, in this case, very much an external organization. But we've worked really closely and hands-on with Mary Jean and her team, including her internal data team, which does a lot of work that, that kind of comes to the, to the sort of look like what an evaluator might do. So I think there's, there's really a synergy. What we would recommend, I think, is that folks externally be a, a hands-on thought partner to the initiative uh, to, to take advantage of the external piece and the independence when possible, particularly when presenting findings beyond the, the backbone and the funder, but also to really be close and to be able to be present. I can't tell you how many times We've taken that trip up to Seattle to meet with her team or meet with the funder, uh, and that's necessary. So I think it's important to work closely, um, but there is some, there are definitely some benefits to being external and to having sort of that critical friend be not in the building. Great. Mary Jane, you have a thought on this? I, I totally agree, and um, when we started, I felt like this was only going to work if you could find that balance between um, trust. You had to have, you had to build trust, so that we would be honest and candid with the evaluation team. Uh, because if we weren't able to do that, then it, it wouldn't really have any value for us. And you know, we're. Um, we're all sticking our necks out all the time, and we're very devoted to continuous improvement philosophy. But if you felt like, in any way, this um, process was, you know, set up as like a gotcha process, um, it would have, you know, zero value and would go down in flames very quickly. So um, that that said, the independence. Is, is critical because you want them to be able to go out and talk to people and get candid information so that we get some feedback that we can use. And uh, the more, you know, the, more, the, the criticisms, the, the constructive comments about how we can do things better, we're hungry for that. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, the way Chris laid it out um, is right, at least for us. Great, thank you. 
we just have a two more minutes in this part of the Q and A. Um, there is a there's a set of questions around. Uh, I just want to let everyone know. Many many of you have asked about budgets and how much have you budgeted and how to figure out a budget. If uh, we're going to save that for um, the general Q and A, but Mary Jean, since you can't um, be with us the entire time, do you have um, any insights um, around? either how you approach budgeting for this particular evaluation and the ongo any ongoing evaluation that you plan to do or are doing, um, or any advice about budgeting. Uh, we want to make sure to hear from you on this question. Um, I think this is a tough one because, you know, you, you every collective impact project that I've come across is so different and it's, level of resource is different. Uh, so we've been very fortunate to have uh, an aligned funders group that is very supportive of the project. I mean, they're in the project with us. They are trying to align their funding to the roadmap indicators of student success. So we're able to do a very comprehensive project, and we're also able to do a very in-depth formative evaluation. Uh, and. And that said, I think if you were on a shoestring budget, there would be ways to structure uh, external uh, formative information gathering that you could do on a low budget. So, you know, I, it's, uh, I'm glad we're in the position we are, but I think if you, if you don't have, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars to spend on something like this, then uh, you, don't, you can't raise that money, then you've got to figure out how to get independent information, you know, for $25,000 a year. I mean, Chris may hate me for saying that, but, um, you know, it's just, it's essential to have the feedback loop. I mean, we're all in the business, in a sense, of improving system function, and so we need, you know, strong feedback, and you've got to get it somehow. I would, just, I would add, um, if, if folks offline want to contact me and, and learn more about the evaluation, and. Uh, how we budgeted for it and have the kind of work scope. I'm happy to talk to someone or exchange emails. I think my information should be available, so um, feel free, folks, to contact me about that. Great, thank you, Chris. I hope you know what you asked for. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you both, uh, Mary Jean and Chris, so much for joining us today. And um, and uh, Chris, I, please stick around, of course, for the rest of the um, webinar. And Mary Jean, thank you for your participation. Well, thank you, and thanks for all the work you're doing on this. Our pleasure. Um, well, now we're going to turn it over to Kathleen Holmes, Program Director at the Missouri Foundation for Health, and Julia Lynn, who is the CEO of Spark Policy Institute, who are going to talk about their experience using developmental evaluation for the Infant Mortality Initiative. Kathleen? Great. Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to speak with you on this topic. I'd first like to provide a brief overview of our initiative to set the stage for the evaluation discussion that follows. Every year in the state of Missouri, approximately 600 babies do not live to see their first birthday. The rate at which babies are dying is highest among the state's African American population at nearly double the rate of non-Hispanic white infants. Many of these infant deaths occur in two areas of the Missouri Foundation for Health Service Area, the city of St. Louis and a region called the Boot Hill, which includes the state's six southeasternmost counties. Late in 2012 and early 2013, Missouri Foundation for Health prioritized infant mortality as one of its four targeted funding areas and decided to focus its efforts in two distinct regions, St. Louis, which is an urban city, and the Boot Hill, a rural region. The need to address the rate of infant mortality in these two communities was already well known and many local nonprofits, hospitals, universities, and other institutions had or were administering small-scale programs. The problem, of course, was that these many standalone programs were not adding up to the substantial change that was needed. The Missouri Foundation for Health decided a new approach was needed and committed to funding the design and launch of initiatives guided by the collective impact framework in each of these targeted communities. In St. Louis, a planning grant was provided to a well-established coalition that understood the maternal and child health issues in that community 
and could guide the effort by providing backbone support. In the Boot Hill region, a planning grant was provided to two organizations involved in infant mortality work and public health practice. These grantees, who have a history of working on the same issues in the same place, but not necessarily in the same way, were encouraged to co-create the Emergent Collective Impact Initiative backbone infrastructure, and they began laying the groundwork for the development of a common agenda. So to support these partners in this early phase of developing a collective impact initiative, the foundation has made available a range of resources, including a public health and maternal health expert who offers content-based technical assistance, a learning coach who helps plan and develop trainings, workshops, and site visits to build grantee skills, capacities, and knowledge base, and two developmental evaluation or DE coaches from Spark Policy Institute and the Center for Evaluation Innovation. The DE coaches support the foundation program staff and the backbone organizations in using DE to improve the design and implementation of their emergent collective impact initiatives. The foundation's intention in the use of DE coaches rather than dedicated evaluators was to build the capacity of the Missouri Foundation for Health staff and their grantees to be able to use DE on their own in their initiatives later years. I'd now like to turn over to Julia, who will continue our presentation and give more information about the DE process. Julia? Great. Thank you, Kathleen. So I want to start by talking a little bit about what developmental evaluation is, since I know it's a term that's not familiar to many people. So developmental evaluation, it's a great fit for collective impact in its early years. You know, when the partners are still assembling the key elements of their work, they're developing initial action plans, they're figuring out what it means to do collective impact, that's, that's that stage of uncertainty. And there's uncertainty about what you can accomplish through collective impact, and there's also uncertainty about which road ahead is the right road. And early in a collective impact effort, developmental evaluation can help with that. So it functions a little bit differently from kind of your traditional formative or summative evaluation. You don't have the predefined evaluation questions with the accompanying outcomes and indicators. Instead, the developmental evaluator's role is to be at the table with you, to help surface issues in a timely manner, to use data and insights to really bring new information into the dialogue. They're part of your learning process. So when you think about even that word, developmental, it really helps you think about the point of it. The evaluator's job is to help you develop, develop new approaches, develop innovations, bring new insights into your work. At a very basic level, when we think about formative and summative evaluation, it helps to tell you what's working and how. When you think about developmental evaluation, it fundamentally is helping you to answer what should we do next? How can we do it in a way that will work best? So if you can advance to the next bullet, in the infant mortality initiative specifically, it was a capacity building approach. So we weren't just doing developmental evaluation, we were focusing heavily on building everyone's skills to do it. So we began with training and capacity building, specifically with the foundation staff. We had an opportunity to do twice monthly coaching calls. They were building their understanding of the developmental evaluation approach, and we were able to build our understanding of how the infant mortality initiative could best benefit from developmental evaluation. And to move to the next bullet, we also worked with the backbone organizations. So with the backbones, the initial step was training at one of their first joint backbone meetings when they all came together. But then at the second meeting, you know, we wanted to move fairly quickly from processing what is developmental evaluation to making sure it had value to their work. And so in that second meeting, we went through a process together of breaking down the issue of infant mortality. What elements of the problem are fairly simple? Which things are pretty complicated and what is genuinely complex? It'll be adapting and hard to figure out ongoing. That discussion helped us to focus developmental evaluation on the areas with the greatest uncertainty. From there, in that same meeting, we started to talk about developmental evaluation questions. And there's actually some kind of great typical questions that you might see developmental evaluation ask during this point in a process. Developmental evaluation might be asking, what are some of the priority values and how do those values affect our decisions and our process? 
who or what is outside the scope of our initiative and what's inside the scope and what are the implications of setting those boundaries. Developmental evaluation might help you think about how the external context is changing, what the problem looks like from different perspectives, and even how to design your strategy to be very nimble and flexible over time. So as we were working with the Backbone organizations, we reviewed these types of example questions, and they generated their own evaluation questions that they wanted us to answer in a fairly quick time frame. So moving to the next slide, the St. Louis site, they were looking very externally. The big questions they were facing were they were in a community with a lot of collective impact work going on. So how could they harness that? How could they engage the breadth of what was happening? And then at a very fundamental level, what's the best way to engage people? What's a process, a message, a structure to motivate participation? In contrast, the Boot Heel had a very different approach. The Boot Heel, they had two new organizations working together in this new partnership, and they, they needed to figure out how to make that partnership really effective. So they were asking questions about how the perspectives of their own organizations differed in addition to their broader stakeholder group, but also how to leverage each other, how to recognize their strengths and develop complementary roles. So we did data collection for both sites. We used a mix of facilitated dialogues with the staff to surface what they knew, key informant interviews, surveys, a variety of different things. And then because this was a capacity building approach, when we generated the results, we didn't own them as the evaluator. We provided them back to the sites in a way they could use in their own dialogues. So to give a very concrete example of what that means, with the boot heel, we reviewed the preliminary results with a couple of their key leaders, and we had a chance to really interpret what those results meant together. And then we created a PowerPoint presentation of the findings, which we walked through those um, same leaders. We walked through it with them, got them familiar with it. The staff then went on to present the findings themselves to the rest of the Backbone staff. They did this at a meeting where critical decisions were being made about how to work together. So they had the information in time to inform a decision-making point. And in fact, that particular learning process, it took five weeks from the day the evaluation question was identified to the day that the leaders were presenting the results back to the rest of their partners. And, and that's one of the things to think about with developmental evaluation. The job of a developmental evaluator is to help you have information in the same time frame you need to use it. So let's move to the next slide to see an example of the types of results they shared in that meeting. So much of the information um, that was in that PowerPoint was, was presented visually. It was given back to them in a way that was more accessible, and this is a, a great example of one of those. The example shows how the respondents to the survey had very different views on how to collaborate as backbone organizations. For some, they really wanted to see one of the two organizations take a primary leadership role. For others, they felt like all of our decisions need to be made together. We need full collaboration. And then some of them had kind of a nuanced version where there were certain decisions that had to be made together, but we also need our freedom to go do our work. These types of results are really helpful. They're surfacing something that needed to be discussed. One of the things I want to highlight here is that the, the ownership of their data is a really important part of the learning process. So in having the developmental evaluation approach be capacity building, part of what we were doing was actually helping them to be better backbone organizations. You know, a good backbone or organization is adaptive. It knows how to respond to its external environment. It's a learning organization. And collective impact really requires that the backbone be ready to do that in a way that leads everyone else in the learning. By building some of their developmental evaluation muscles, they're building that adaptive capacity that is so critical as a backbone. Let's flip to the next slide and talk about some of the key learnings across the sites. So with the boot heel, our overarching learnings from that original set of evaluation questions was really about the relationships between the two organizations. It helped to surface some underlying dynamics, differences in beliefs about the drivers of infant mortality. For example, for some people, it was very much a systemic issue driven by economic factors and health system factors. But for others, it was an individual behavior issue driven by the actions that individuals were taking. We also learned about different beliefs that they had about their own organization's capacity and the other organization's capacity to take on the work. So this, this type of boot heel learning, it's a great example of developmental evaluation surfacing what can be uncomfortable information, an underlying set of dynamics that are going to affect 
the work, and so you really want them to be on the table. And by bringing a developmental evaluator in, you can bring those issues to the surface in a way that's a little bit safer and easier to process, and that means easier to get to a good decision. So as a result of this work, the boot heel is moving forward with a facilitated process. And the goal of that process is to develop a strong decision-making structure and a governance model for how they can work together. St. Louis region. So here we learned how to better message and engage stakeholders across many different sectors. It's kind of figuring out where's the enthusiasm for this work. The St. Louis learning is actually a really good example of how developmental evaluation early in collective impact, it can be anticipatory. It can help you think broadly about the range of things that you could be doing and what might be the most effective ways to do it. In this case, uh, you know, we were actually filling a gap as well. Other initiatives might have a communications person on board who can do message testing. But because St. Louis didn't have that, some of the work we were doing really was around the message. And also we had some internal learning with the foundation. They've actually become quite experts at using before and after action reviews, which is a skill set that you can apply not just in collective impact, but in any initiative to kind of reflect on and become more effective each time you do something. Let's move on to the next step as Kathleen steps in to talk about some of the lessons learned. Great. Thanks again, Julia. Um, yeah, we'd like to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about um, sort of what we've learned. And I, I'd probably start by saying, to be perfectly honest, it's fairly difficult. Um, if you're looking for simple and easy, this work of collective impact really isn't, isn't it. Um, and neither is development of, developmental evaluation. There's uh, a learning curve for people to be able to use developmental evaluation, and that was certainly the case for foundation staff as well as the grantees. It takes some time to understand the theoretical basis, and especially for the grantees who have so much going on in developing the initiative, it's not what they have a lot of time for. However, the flexibility that developmental evaluation offers we found to be critical. Six months ago, we would not have known the issues we are facing now would be our most complex and uncertain issues. Other evaluation approaches that we might have used would have allowed us to monitor what we thought early on might be important, but developmental evaluation helps us keep up with what's changing and helps us move along the way. So we thought we'd also um, address some of our challenges, and, and quite honestly, the biggest challenge is one that I just alluded to. It's the coaching model um, that we proposed. While it helps build capacity and expand understanding of where to use developmental evaluation, proved in our experience to be um, insufficient for the grantees. The reality on the ground is that the grantees need someone embedded to help them surface issues rather than someone external that they need to check in with. There really isn't space in the collective impact startup to engage in learning in the way you might in a less intensive, complex startup. Once again, however, the coaching calls with the foundation staff, as Julia mentioned, has been very effective. Because we engaged with the DE consultants early on, we developed a common language that helped us understand each other's needs and methods of working. And it provided a nice foundation for understanding the potential that DE can accomplish in these types of efforts. The ongoing coaching calls are helping us stay connected at the foundation level and watchful for opportunities where DE can help. I'll quickly turn it back to, Ju to Julia to offer some final comments regarding where we're going from here. Great. Thank you so much. So, one of the things that we recognized, as Kathleen mentioned, is that there's a need for more on-the-ground capacity related to developmental evaluation. And that means that for this um, kind of next coming year, instead of focusing on what are some of the questions we can answer, we'll still do some of that, but a lot of our focus is going to be how do we build capacity in Missouri for local embedded evaluators who know how to do developmental evaluation. It's definitely a skill set. It's some techniques that go beyond the traditional evaluation skill set that a lot of us are trained with. So working with the foundation, we have put together a plan that includes recruiting in two evaluators who want to learn the skill, and we'll be coaching them. 
We're going to coach them in how to do a developmental evaluation from understanding complexity to learning how to be adaptive and responsive to even learning how to present information back in a way that facilitates learning. So part of what's happening here is that both the sites and the foundation, they already have a common language and understanding of developmental evaluation. They even have experience around what it can accomplish and why it's valuable. That means the barrier to entry for these embedded evaluators is a lot lower than it would have been a year ago. The twice a month coaching they're going to receive along with a full toolbox of practical hands-on tools will also help them take their roles to kind of the next level. We think that there's a lot of benefit to this approach beyond just for the infant mortality initiative by building developmental evaluation capacity in Missouri, particularly capacity related to collective impact. It's going to benefit the other collective impact initiatives in the state as well. So I'm going to turn it back to Hallie right now for the question and answer section. Thank you very much, Kathleen and Julia. Fantastic. Uh, presentation. And again, another about you know 75 questions came in as you were talking. Um, and some of those will stay for the general Q&A because they're more general and we'd love to hear Chris weigh in on those too. Um, just so the audience knows, there have been uh, several uh, questions about resources for developmental evaluation. And um, just quickly say that um, there is a book by Michael Q. Patton called Developmental Evaluation. Uh, it's kind of the Bible of DE. Um, FSC also wrote and published a paper called Evaluating Social Innovation um, about a year and a half ago, and that is on our website, uh, fsc.org. Um, certainly you can write to us for more resources, but uh, both Michael Quinn Patton's book and our paper reference lots of other resources as well, and we can take other conversations offline. Um, now, so a question to um, our uh, Missouri Foundation for Health and, and Spark Policy folks. Um, the first one, I think, um, looks uh, to Kathleen. Um, this is an interesting question. For Boot Hill, Hill, is the evaluation also serving as the facilitator to help build their capacity to develop governance and agreement on decision making? Or is it using an outside facilitator? Um, I would say it's a little bit of both. It certainly started with developmental evaluation by sort of raising that as um, an issue. We've, they've since um, engaged another consultant to help uh, facilitate that process, although uh, a lot of it is being done internally by the two organizations as well. Um, we did just recently have a joint meeting. We have quarterly joint meetings of all of our backbone organizations, and we actually investigated sort of the decision-making process a little further with the help of Julia as a facilitator for that. So we do a lot of um, cross-pollination, uh, if you will, with our learning within the initiative and um, facilitated at times by our onboard consultants uh, uh, consultants and sometimes by those that have been engaged by the backbone organizations. Okay, great, thank you. Now this question um, could be for either of you. Um, do you have any advice for ways and strategies or tools for the developmental evaluation in supporting the partners as they're tackling trust and turf issues? So as we all know, collective impact is full of uh, different kinds of challenges and oftentimes you know, the, the challenge of bringing people together and agreeing and and you know, being open and candid and transparent and, and so on. So tools and approaches for tackling the trust issues, especially with regard to evaluating a collective impact initiative. Any suggestions there? This is Julia. Um, I have a couple of very concrete things that we use for that exact issue. So this is not uncommon in a lot of collective impact initiatives, not just during the early years, but ongoing. There can be kind of hip, hiccups along the way with relationships. So as a developmental evaluator, one very basic thing is you have to build good relationships. You have to get to know the people involved and make sure that they trust you so that they can share what's really going on. But the practical tools I use, one is um, what I call just a casual one-on-one -on -one conversations. Even though they're scheduled and on the phone, they're pretty open-ended. They're fairly unstructured so that people really can share what's happening and dig into whatever it is that's kind of at that moment that they're struggling with, which can be trust issues. It can be budget issues. It can be concerns about the partner's ability to do the work. The other tool we use is what we call a right now 
survey, which is a half-page piece of paper with, you know, one to three questions that all start with right now. And you hand it out in a meeting when everyone's right there, and it takes them less than five minutes, and you can learn right now what their biggest concerns are, right now what the best opportunities for success are. It's not very deep data, but it's funny how you can actually get great signals of where to dig a little deeper just from that simple, very quick survey. Thank you, Justin. And this is Kathleen. I would just add that really setting the stage for um, being able to address trust issues or, um, ha you know, have them come up if that's an issue is, is right from the very start when you um, engage with your partners in this type of work, really establishing sort of the baseline for that trust to be built, um, being open, um, having good communication, um, being responsive when needs are, um, you know, mentioned, and or and if you can't if you can't respond to them, making sure um, folks know why. So um, right from the start, uh, trust needs to be built in these types of um, initiatives. Thank you. Excellent. There are another um, set of questions around the time the commitment that the partners. Um, it's taking for the staff and the partners to engage in, in the developmental evaluation. Um, how do partners feel like spending time on, on the evaluation? How do you record all the information that they're providing? But I think there's a, in terms of the time commitment, I think there's a set of questions around how do you get people's time and, and how much time does it actually take? So this is Julia. I can dive in on that and I'm sure Kathleen will have more to add. I think that one thing to keep in mind is this particular initiative has a, a capacity building approach tied to the developmental evaluation, so that adds a little bit more time. Um, but kind of at the most basic level in developmental evaluation, you engage with the partners at the level that they need to be engaged at, that they identify that they need. Um, a lot of your job is to be present and in the meetings and able to help identify the issues um, and then the issues that resonate, that the, everyone agrees as you kind of start talking about them, that is something we need to work through. Uh, typically at that point, the time that you're investing is because everyone's agreeing it's important to invest. In that sense, it's a little bit different than traditional evaluation where you may have an ongoing reporting or tracking tool or a survey at a preset time, um, and it's hard to kind of in advance know what's going to be the value added to me. With developmental evaluation, what you're investigating at any given moment is something that the partners are already saying, this is really important and we need to do it. It still does take time. Um, for the backbone organizations in the boot heel, we had two staff who probably over the course of that five-week window put probably 10 to 12 hours in, and everyone else did a 20-minute survey. And then for the St. Louis in that cycle related to stakeholder engagement, they put quite a bit more time in because they actually used their time with us to test out what their messaging could look like and design a stakeholder engagement structure so we could get external feedback on both of those messaging and the engagement structure. Yeah, I would just add that I think it's the time uh, commitment is variable. It does uh, honestly depend on the activities, but I agree with Julia that um, understanding uh, the potential for that DE has to offer as far as understanding the issue that you're trying to um, get past is really uh, sort of a mindset that has to be uh, done and then it seems less of a chore than it does seem like a step in the process. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Kathleen and Julia, for you know your response to these questions and your presentation. We're going to open it up now and invite Chris back into the conversation um, as the uh, evaluator uh, for the Robat project. And uh, have, we have about 15 minutes left, left of general Q&A. Um, and there, there's one question that several people have asked that I think it's fair to ask any and all of you. And that has to do with um, uh, developmental evaluation and formative evaluation specifically. And uh, Julia, as you said, you know, it's fairly new and not, not everyone knows about it. The question's really focused on what is the difference between developmental evaluation and formative evaluation and developmental evaluation and performance management? Um, so would one of you like to tackle that one? <laughs> this is Julia. I'm happy to begin that. Um, 
So I think that in some ways they overlap and in some ways they're distinctly different. Um, so they overlap in the sense that formative evaluation and a developmental evaluation are both intended to be a partner who can help you figure out the road ahead, how to do the work as effectively as possible. One of the ways they differ quite a bit is that developmental evaluation is inherently focused on the idea that there isn't a road that once you figured it out, you're going to stay on. It really recognizes that in complex settings like collective impact, you're constantly developing. You're never going to have the perfect protocol for how to engage all your stakeholders and keep them on board. And you're never going to have the perfect approach for how to address all the drivers of the problem that you're tackling. And so the developmental evaluation needs to be highly responsive to what's happening in the moment, the ways that the external context is changing and what that means for how your strategies might change. So at a very practical level, the developmental evaluator doesn't typically have an evaluation plan with preset questions and preset outcomes and preset data collection. It's very adaptive and responsive. And this is Chris, um, to just uh, kind of follow up on that. I agree with Julia that I think they're very similar and a lot of this has to do with when you come into a project. We came in sort of within two years after the initiative had started. So you had a lot of things in place. You had a theory of change. You had work groups with um, action plans doing implementation. So uh, the formative piece, I think, has to be mindful of the flexibility while also the fact that you are working within some existing structures and vision of the work, and then you want to be adaptable and provide that feedback so that work can evolve. So I think they're probably close relatives. Um, but there are differences depending on when you begin engaging in the project work as an evaluator. Great. Kathleen, do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, yeah, Kathleen. Um, actually, I agree with both of them. Very well said. <laughs> okay, great. Um, the next question is, is a little bit different, um, and I'm, I'm just jumping around to see uh, some of the themes here. This one has to do with the theory of change, and what happens, the question goes, what happens if your theory of change changes during the course of your initiative? How do you, how do you adjust your indicators? Do you see one? <laughs> um, this is Julia. I'll go ahead and dive in. Uh, so one is, I think it's great that theories of change do change, um, and they should. Because as we get deeper and deeper into the work, we begin to understand the drivers of the problem um, in new ways. And I think when it comes to changing indicators, it actually depends on what you need to change. If you've realized that the end of the road indicators, the kind of big ones that you're paying attention to in your shared measurement system weren't the right ones, then absolutely change to the ones that are, are the right signals of success. And you may want to kind of backtrack and see what data is available from the past about those um, new indicators so that you can have a little bit more comprehensive story. I think if it's more the interim outcomes, the, the pieces along the way that tell you whether you're getting towards those um, kind of end of the road outcomes, I actually think it's really important that those do change over time because what we're doing should change. We shouldn't have the same set of activities in years two and three of collective impact as we would in years eight, nine, and ten. And so it's actually really smart to adapt what you're measuring to where you're at in your initiative. Great, thank you. Chris, do you have a thought on this? Uh, I think Julia said it quite well. <laughs> okay. All right. How about this one? Um, this one is for you, Chris. Um, the roadmap evaluation as described seems to focus on effectiveness of implementing the CI five conditions and on effects on and changes in systems. To what extent is the evaluation looking at how these things are becoming? Excuse me. To what extent is the evaluation looking at how these things are beginning to make an impact on the end results being sought? That's a, that's a great question. So uh, I think that's where we're turning as we move now to sort of the, the, the last year plus of the evaluation. So what we've been looking at really is the kind of core elements of the roadmap theory of change, which kind of take, distills kind of that, those dimensions into those, those, those kind of buckets that Mary Jean had laid out about alignment, parents, and community engagement and data leading to stronger systems. I think what we want to look for going forward is what evidence is there in the region that stronger systems have been created 
and what does that mean both for movement in the kind of core indicators and more generally progress towards the goals. I also think uh, the goal of doubling numbers, that also means that we, we were working really closely with Roadmap to help them think about how do they track more, more carefully their own progress so they can know whether they're on track uh, to be meeting the goal at 2020. Our evaluation work will let with them is scheduled to end next year, so they will need help and capacity to really know how they're going to be able to track progress in that four plus years afterwards so they can see are the dimensions of the work leading ultimately to accomplishing the, the outcome. So that's where we're turning and I'm hopeful that we'll have findings around that in the next year plus. All right, thank you. Okay, we have about five minutes left for Q&A. Um, this other question, here's a, here's a question. Um, a lot of folks are, are, you know, committed to collecting data and using data for decision making, but they also need to, um, you know, share their findings with others and show the value add of collective impact and, and balance the accountability with the learning piece at the same time. So this person asks, do you have any advice for successfully and strategically sharing findings outward to demonstrate the value add of the work? This is Kathleen. I can jump in real quickly with um, just a, um, a short story, I guess, about how we've done it. So really in this early stage of development, our main goal was really developing, developing the capacities of the grantees, like we said in the past, to effectively guide the initiatives going forward. So accountability for us at this point really was measured by the extent to which that was accomplished, both through efforts of the grantees and the foundation staff. Um, learning by way of the DE activities and the other resources really provided, um, that were provided, the other resources that was were provided was seen really as key and a critical step to accomplishing this objective. So for us it wasn't really a question of balance or, or seeing that these two things, um, accountability and learning were in conflict, but really understanding how they were linked. And we've had um, situations where uh, folks in sort of highlighting this have have told what they've accomplished. So in regards to the boot hill, sort of how the DE has really helped them reach a point where they're able to move forward in their process. It's, it, it's key um, to the work that they're going to do for this initiative, but um, even thinking longer term on the work that gets accomplished um, in their community. So telling that story at our point in the process has been one of the activities that we've undertaken. Thanks, Kathleen. Julia or Chris, do you have anything to add? Other ideas? So I think I would add, this is Julia, um, in some of the other collective impact evaluations we're doing where we're the evaluator rather than the coach, one of our first steps is to do one-on-one -on -one conversations with um, key stakeholders, including board members of the backbone and also the funders. And in those conversations, we seek to surface what they expect to hear, what types of information resonate, what are the types of outcomes they expect to hear about, and that allows us to both match the evaluation design to what the actual collective impact initiative needs, as well as prepare in advance that we have certain stories that you know need to be told to different audiences and let's not fail to get the data that will help us for those stories. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, so um, I think that's going to round out our, our question and answer period. We have some conclu uh, concluding remarks from Jen. But before we before I hand it over to Jen, uh, first of all, thank you so much for our panelists, Chris and Julia and Kathleen, for being with us today. Uh, your presentations were so informative, and I can't tell you. I think there are over 200 questions that were posed, so people are very curious and interested. Um, we'll try to share those those questions with you that are our specific. Uh, we might have some blog posts about this but for follow up. Um, but I wanted to mention that um, the three-part guide that I mentioned um, at the beginning of the webinar today and that Marcy described in terms of our framework um, and the, uh, the details of, of how to think about evaluating collective impact initiatives, um, I wanted to just reinforce that the, the guide um, as a three-parter, uh, we actually it all connects, 
uh, but we didn't think anyone wanted to read a 90-page document, so we divided it into three pieces. Um, but essentially, it really is help, trying to be helpful and thinking about what is the relationship between accountability, accountability and learning, as Kathleen described. It really tries to show the relationship between shared measurement systems and evaluation and how they complement one another. It describes different evaluation approaches and gives a sense of different kinds of methods, as well as how to think about a budget, how to think about communicating and reporting with various audiences. And, and almost as importantly or more is that it, it provides a set of uh, sample evaluation questions and outcomes and indicators for the five conditions as well as uh, context and, um, and, and a variety of other the systems changes and, um, and behavior changes that we were talking about. So if you haven't had a chance to look at the guide, I really encourage you to do so. We're hopeful that it will be a really useful tool for, for the field. So without further ado, um, thank you again to our panelists, and I'm going to hand it over to Jen with some final thoughts and information. Jen? Great. Thank you, Hallie, and thank you to all of our panelists today. That was terrific. And before we close, I just want to be sure that everyone knows about the range of resources <clears throat> available from the Collective Impact Forum. And in case this is the first time you're learning about the forum, the goals of our initiative are to create and curate the knowledge, networks, and tools that accelerate the adoption and increase the quality of collective impact implementation. And there are two main components to the forum. The first is the online platform, collectiveimpactforum.org, which is organized around a robust uh, resource library of tools, case studies, and research on collective impact, as well as an online community for people to seek input from each other, from peers, on questions that are servicing in your work. And in the Q&A here, I saw several questions around uh, looking for tools and resources that others are using to evaluate their collective impact work. So I'd encourage those of you doing evaluation, if you're willing to share tools on that platform, as well as to seek input from others on what's working in your evaluation of collective impact on the Collective Impact Forum website. We've created it just for that very purpose. And in addition to the website, we're supporting in-person learning through communities of practice, convenings, and other events across the country that enable practitioners and funders of Collective Impact to engage in even deeper learning. Next slide. And so to whet your appetite, we've included a screenshot of the Forum website here which you can see highlights resources, events, news, a blog, and the online community all related to collective impact. And access to all of these resources on the website are available free of charge. So if you haven't yet created a profile on the forum or logged in, we really encourage you to do so today. So thank you all for joining us. We know we weren't able to answer all of your questions, but we will be posting responses to many of them online. So please watch for updates. And in the meantime, as Hallie mentioned, you can find today the guide on the Collective Impact Forum website, and today's PowerPoint slides will be posted on the website as well. So thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to keeping in touch and learning from you as you continue to evaluate collective impact in your work as well. Thank you.